Welcome to Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and as always, thanks for watching. Well, Pennsylvania as an international powerhouse, but first, we're going to take a look at the appeals court elections on November 2. We'll get through those subjects and more after these words. Welcome to the fast-paced and unrehearsed weekly discussion featuring the leaders who help shape your world. Join us as we address the issues that impact you each and every day. This is Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and now, here's your host, Terry Madonna. Welcome back to the program. Well, we have a bunch of important subjects to get into on Pennsylvania Newsmakers. Joining me, as often as the case, is John Meisick. He's editor-in-chief of Pennsylvania Capital Star, and Brad Bumstead. He's the bureau chief of the caucus. Gentlemen, welcome, as always. We're delighted to have you here. All right, let's start out with these things called the appeals court. We got the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, the Superior Court, the Commonwealth Court. There are four candidates running in, in, in those three elections. And I must tell you, John Meisick, I can't name them without the list in front of me, and the voters know very little about them. Take it. Uh, Terry, you just, you just nailed it. I mean, the average Pennsylvania voter could probably not name any of the candidates who are running for the state's three appellate benches right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these are hugely consequential races. The state courts have their mitts in just everything. I mean, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, for instance, is responsible for tossing out the state's congressional map in 2018 mm -hmm. and giving us the map that we have now. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a progressive majority on the court right now. The seat that is opening up is one that was held by a judge, a justice, pardon me, who was elected as Republican. Uh, so whomever Supreme Court, Supreme right. Court. So whomever wins there will not affect materially affect the balance of power on the high court. But I mean, this I mean, this goes to sort of the underlying problem with the way Pennsylvania selects its appellate court judges. Most voters don't know judges are barred by professional ethics from talking too much about how they might rule yeah, against might rule, right. cases that would come before them. So, you know, voters don't have a whole lot of information with which to make up their minds. So extraneous factors like ballot position or yeah. name recognition or geography instead win the day. And these are mostly straight party votes because if the people don't know anything about them, if, you know, they're largely a vote straight party. Party right? is, is a, a huge consideration yeah. all of it. Wow, what the heck, I don't know who it is, but <laughs> I'll take a Democrat or a Republican. But uh, it's not only the average people don't know about that. We don't know. <laughs> I've, I've interviewed a bunch of people this week, officials, let's say. I mm -hmm. won't embarrass them. Say, I couldn't name them all. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. You know. Well, I don't know them without the list in front of me. I oh, mean, absolutely. a couple of the names, you know, they've run some television ads, but uh, you get that. I mean, the Superior, the Supreme Court, you know, maybe a little, yeah, but exactly. the Superior and Commonwealth Court, no way, no how, right? Before we started the show and you, before you were here, I asked Harry, I said, look, please, one thing, just don't ask us to name. Because <laughs> <laughs> I can do the same. I can do Supreme and one, one Commonwealth and yeah. one, one Superior. Yeah. That's about yeah. it. And the problem there, Terry, is that opens the door mostly to these races being determined by a very small constituency of people, and that's mostly mm -hmm. the lawyers who are going to appear before sure. these judges and whose firms have business before the court. It's not really steered yeah. by, the, by the voters. If I remember this correctly, I think there's only eight states, seven, eight states that elect all of their judges, which we do here, correct? Well, th th that's partially true. I mean, yeah. th there are seven or eight who do elections for judges, but there are variants even within those seven or eight that okay. they have you know, a four year period and then come come back for a retention election okay. and things like that. So Okay. So what 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 do reformers want to do? Okay, so I there, think I there, know the answer. There has been talk out. since approximately William Penn uh, about changing the way Pennsylvania selects its judges. There's been I'm, I I kid there, of course, but I feel like it's been around forever. So going to merit selection, the folks at Pennsylvania uh, Pennsylvanians for Modern Courts, sort of the vanguard reformer group, have been talking for a long time um, about a hybrid appointive elective system. Uh, where a panel of experts and other, you know, sort of graybeards would, would present a slate of candidates to the governor. The governor would then nominate them. They would be confirmed by the state senate, serve for some period of time, and right. then stand for a ten-year, uh, then stand right. for re-election and kind of go right. from there. Um, they argue that's sort of the best of both worlds. That way, you sure. can take the politics out of the front end, but still give voters a, a say. At the moment, go ahead. Well, the critics of that would say that the whole reason it was started is William Penn wanted to make the appointments. <laughs> <laughs> I think that goes back a little ways, it does, right? <laughs> right. I'm just kidding about that. But the variant now that, that's out there, I shouldn't say variant, it makes you think of the virus, but, yes. uh, but of 
this election system is to have regional elections oh, yeah. for appellate courts in Pennsylvania. So instead of one statewide, yeah. you'd be voting on one yeah. for central Pennsylvania, yeah. one for Philadelphia, one for Pittsburgh. Yeah. What that would do is give Republicans a lot more opening because of the rural areas. And, and their Republican control, they might be able to pass and, it. And, we, and actually what goes on here is they don't run, quote, independent, but they're listed as Democrats and Republicans on the ballot. Now, when you get the after 10 years, it's retention. That's different. Right. That's just a yes or no vote. So this ends up, in a sense, being partisan because Democrat, Republican. No. Oh, I mean, not in a sense. It ends up being absolutely partisan <laughs> where they raise gobs and gobs of money. And I mean, you, you talk to any legislative Republican who's still harboring a grudge mm -hmm. um, over the Supreme Court tossing the congressional maps three right. years ago. So, I mean, they really want this. And, and, and retention is, is really sort of meaningless because yeah. there's only one person I know of who lost a retention race, and that was because of the pay rate. Yeah. Yep. All right, we're going to move on. Uh, it was no surprise that uh, the Attorney General of the state of Pennsylvania, Josh Shapiro, is now a Democratic candidate for governor, and we'll get to that after these words. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry, the statewide voice of business, and by the Pennsylvania State Education Association and Partners for Public Education bringing the power of a great education to our schools, our students, and our communities. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Highway Information Association, the go-to source to learn about transportation projects and issues please visit pahighwayinfo.org. And by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. All right, this past week, Josh Shapiro has decided he's going to, actually he decided long before that that he was going to run for governor. Brad Bumstead, I'll tell you, I don't remember a time when a candidate entered a race either for the United States Senate or for governor in the state of Pennsylvania, that it dominated the news the way Josh Shapiro's announcement in uh, Pittsburgh. I don't remember any quite like it. I mean, <laughs> you know, Dick Thornburg's was was pretty big thing with the fly around the oh, state, sure. but but no, it's it's uh, pretty amazing. It was the worst kept secret in Harrisburg, yeah. of course. Uh, some, some would say that Josh Shapiro has been running since he was elected attorney general, or maybe before that. Yeah. Uh, but he, he is. Uh, uh, a formidable candidate. He, he's extremely competent. Uh, he's cautious and he's ambitious. Yeah, some have said this is a prelude to running for the presidency. Yeah. I'm not going to, John, I'm not going to oh, get ahead of let's, myself. Let's not, let's not even get started with that. You'll only right. encourage him. Uh, you know, no, he doesn't need any encouragement. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I mean, I think Brad is absolutely right. I mean, the, the, the coverage this, that this has gotten this week is pretty extraordinary. I mean, I think it goes also to Shapiro's star power as well. I mean, he's, he is a, a, you know, in the galaxy of Democratic stars nationwide. He is right up there. Mm -hmm. uh, he, like Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman, is on MSNBC roughly every 15 seconds, it feels <laughs> like. Um, you know, so there's a lot of expectation. There's a, you know, there's a lot of build up to this. Because, you know, Terry, we can't leave out the fact that Pennsylvania is a hugely consequential state oh, politically yeah. and there there are so many issues at play from the in election investigation to the fight over abortion rights to the fight over voting rights over voting where rights, yeah. who holds this job after governor tom wolf is term limited out of office in 2022 is is huge it takes an on outsized importance not only for pennsylvania voters yeah. but also in the national political firmament i don't remember a, another attorney general that was omnipresent as he has been traveling all over the state. I don't think he's a, not a glad hander, but boy, when he had something to say, he said it. And he routinely, you know, all over the state. I think you're right. I think that uh, the only one who comes close to that and was a different time, different era, different media, mm -hmm. uh, was Ernie Priate. Ernie Priate, yeah. But, but I'm sure Josh would not like being compared <laughs> to him. But on, on the other <laughs> hand, uh, you know, he is exactly what, you, what you're saying. And, um, you know, he, he will be formidable as a candidate. He may, may have cleared the field by just announcing. I mean, if we see a Democrat get in there, it's not likely to be a, a prominent one, I don't right. believe. Yeah. But even so, he's, he's a favorite. However, a lot of Republicans I talk to think 
he can be had. And some progressives are not happy about him as well because he's tough on crime, supports uh, uh, the death penalty for what he refers to as heinous, heinous crimes. Yeah, I mean, Josh, Josh ironically is not, not ironically enough, but he's, he's on the state board of pardons, just like John Fetterman is. Mm -hmm. um, so you have that really right. stark contrast. We have Fetterman, the criminal justice reformer who wants to get rid of life without parole, who wants sure. to get rid of the death penalty, who wants to legalize recreational marijuana. And Josh, um, is much more modulated and much more careful about that stuff. And that has not endeared him to some progressives. Uh, but his stance on stuff like abortion rights, I think, sort of maybe yeah. perhaps balances some of that out. Legalization of recreational marijuana as well, right? Uh, he, I believe, is not on board with yes. this. He is, he is yeah. on board yeah. with yeah. it now. Okay. He, is, then he, then he, he wasn't for a while. Then he has, yeah. then he, pardon me, then he has yeah. changed his position. He did. Um, but I mean, you know, that, 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 could, uh, okay. that could balance it out. All right, we're going to run to a break and we come back. Pennsylvania as an international powerhouse. I want to thank the reporters for being on this week and we'll get to Pennsylvania and trade after these words. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by Cross State Credit Union Association. Credit unions where people are worth more than money. To find a credit union that is right for you, go to ibelong.org and by the Energy Association of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania's energy information source. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Association of Pennsylvania State College and University Faculties representing the faculty and coaches who are devoted to providing quality public higher education for Pennsylvania's college students. All right, we're going to talk about Pennsylvania as an international powerhouse, and we'll get into the impact of the pandemic on international trade, and how about this, economic development in Pennsylvania. Joining me to do that is Wilfred Muskins. He's the international business advisor advisor for the from the marquee group i think i got mm -hmm. that all right you got you got to thank you well, terry yeah. well look uh let's start with the big with the big topic we normally don't think of the state of pennsylvania as an international powerhouse i mean mm -hmm. we know about our domestic economy right you know historically how important we were to the industrial revolution but now it's absolutely. international trade correct absolutely very important for the state and and i think a lot of people don't think about it or realize it on a daily basis, you don't necessarily see that. But yeah. when you look at the combination of how important exports are for Pennsylvania, you know, with, with you know, maybe close to $40 billion every year of say exports. Say that again. <laughs> 40 billion. <laughs> 40 billion, billion dollars. It's a little exports. less last year, but yeah. Yeah, pandemic. Exports. Yeah. Uh, then, of course, imports. Uh, but you also have other things like tourism, international tourism, which is really important for Philadelphia, oh, but yeah. also for central Pennsylvania. Yeah. Gettysburg, Hershey, uh, oh, Pittsburgh, sure. of course, as well. And uh, international education. Uh, if you count all the international students that come to the state every year, which is on average about 50,000, yeah. 50,000 people from all over the country. And there's the a world. lot of recruitment by the colleges and universities in particular yes. now for international students. That really has become more important over the last three years. Obviously, with enrollment numbers uh, domestically and regionally going mm -hmm. down for a lot of schools, uh, international recruitment has become more important. Yeah. And, and, yeah. Well, another re related, you know, we keep hearing and seeing the fact that, you know, Trade has been cut back because of the mm -hmm. pandemic, and we virtually yeah. everything is in short supply. Right. So uh, you're the expert on the economy. <laughs> well, How, that's a is that a, that as serious as everybody says it is? It, it is a it is a big problem. Uh, you know, it has positive sides as well because the fact is that last year, of course, during the pandemic, if you look at our exports, Pennsylvania exports went down. I think about 13 percent mm -hmm. in 2020. But you see that pick up tremendously now this year. It's, it's, it's gone up over 20% this year over last year. So we're actually catching up and we're surpassing our exports from last year. Uh, so there's more trade. And because there's more trade, there are logistical mm -hmm. problems that, that we're dealing with right now. Not enough containers, not enough you know, staff in the ports. Sure. Uh, the railways, the airports uh, are, are, are challenged in terms of cargo. Uh, and that, that creates bottlenecks in the economy, and that creates problems for all of us as consumers. When we want to buy our Christmas yeah. presents or just get something for our family, it, you know, it can take a little longer than yeah. we used to. 
Everybody yeah. says that when we come on, on the holidays to buy your gifts now, <laughs> don't wait because you might not be able to get them because of uh, the difficulties with yeah, trade. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think we still have a little bit of time, you know, but, but it's true that containers are sp spending more time in the ports than they're used to, mm -hmm. sometimes two, three, four times longer. Uh, simply, as I said earlier, the logistics are not adapted to the current trade levels. You, you talked about export. How about, mm -hmm. how about import? Well, imports went down as well, of course, during the pandemic, uh, and they're picking up again this year as well. But exports have been growing more than imports, which is, which is good for the economy because we want to export more, import less, so we have a smaller trade deficit. Uh, and that is, a, that is a goal that we have as a state, I think, <laughs> most people. Oh, yeah. But as a country, you know, our trade deficits are tremendous. And if you look at, uh, actually, we had record trade deficits this year, mm -hmm. b uh, bigger than, than any time in history, uh, which means we need to export more. I think that's the message I think I've always tried to, uh, to pass along when I was deputy secretary in Harrisburg and, and since I'm in the private sector. Exporting is essential for our economy, right. and we need more smaller and medium-sized companies in particular to get into the export yeah. game. Yeah. All right, we're going to run to a break. When we come back, I want to talk about economic development in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. something uh, you're an expert on, and we'll get back after That's these great. words. Thank you. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Medical Society. Inspired physicians committed to the good health of Pennsylvanians and the advancement of the practice of medicine. All right, I'm chatting with Wilford Muskins. He's the international business advisor for the Marquis Group. He's an expert on trade, international, domestic as well. And we're going to turn toward, uh, to a very, very important subject, economic development in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. All right, what do we need to know about that? <laughs> well, it, it, I think what's really important, and I've worked for many years in economic development in, in, in the state, in state government, but also in the, in the private sector. Uh, it is something that I think should be really separated from politics. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, what I've seen having worked under five different governors over the years is that that program sometimes gets support from a governor and then don't get support from the next governor. So you get sure. those up and down effects, yeah. which is really in economic development, you have to have the long, the, the, the long term That's view. That's a good point. Right? You have to look at companies that set up now, they're going to create jobs in five years or in 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, it's, it, so that's why I think politics and economic development should really. Uh, are, small, are small businesses driving the economy <clears throat> with the yeah. creation of them in the last 20, 30 years? Most definitely. If you look at uh, just in the technology sector, in terms of startups, uh, startups in uh, information technology, in, in digital media, and, you know, coming out of Pittsburgh, for example, with CMU, or coming out of Philadelphia with Drexel or, or, or you know, Penn, mm -hmm. uh, and many, many others around the, the, the state. Uh, that has been really, really important. And, and economic development in that sector has, has been really well uh, organized in Pennsylvania because we have the Ben Franklin, ben Franklin Technology Partners oh, sure. Program, which has been very popular and successful over the years in creating new, new startups. Yeah. Um, but there's many other companies that are not, that, doesn't, that don't fall under that but category. But there's been a big evolution at, you know, 40, 50 years ago, we were one of the industrial kingpins in mm -hmm. the country with coal and iron and steel. Right. And now it's natural gas. Right. I mean, uh, even uh, President Biden, when he was candidate Biden in August of 2020, guess what? He went out to Pittsburgh mm -hmm. and said, I'm for fracking. Governor mm -hmm. Wolf has been a strong supporter of fracking because yeah. of the importance to, now they get concerned about the environmental damage, the pipeline situation, yeah. which everybody has talked about. Yeah. But so what's the situation in terms well, of, uh, of, of, of that, that component of our society? Well, the, 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 there's one common factor is that Pennsylvania has energy, right? I think if you look at, we had coal, we had of course the nuclear industry with, with Westinghouse in Pittsburgh. Uh, and now, as you said, shale gas is, is a very big sector, has grown and has allowed, talking about economic development, has allowed smaller communities in northwest and north, north central and northern tier of Pennsylvania to grow and to create jobs. So there's a real big positive economic development effect. But you can't forget about the environmental impacts. And I think our, our DEP in Pennsylvania has really mm -hmm. been on top of that. 
and there have been there have been accidents, there have been mistakes made, yeah. uh, but there have been penalties <laughs> to be paid. So, it, so it has to be very well regulated, but it is a huge economic development benefit because it allows us to create uh, to attract new companies from overseas. Talking about international business. Yeah, that, you know? that, that's my next question. Talk about the future mm -hmm. and where you think it it will go and what industries. What aspects of the economy do you mm -hmm. think will be the strongest? Well, I, I see a lot of manufacturing companies that are staying and growing in, in Pennsylvania versus maybe a couple of years ago where they would have moved out of the state mm -hmm. and even moved out of the country in mm -hmm. some cases. Because of our energy supply now, which is very critical, as you know, there's an energy oh, yeah. crisis around the world. Many countries are, are, are struggling with the coming winter season, including, I think, consumers in, in Pennsylvania. but. Having the supply of shale gas in Pennsylvania mm -hmm. is, a, is a huge benefit. It's not the only one. Yeah, we, of course, we talked about higher education. Having the, having the best people, the best employees adapted to the workforce that is needed in the future by our companies is essential. And that, that also is a long-term thing. <laughs> Again, no, no, but the long-term yeah, yeah. things are important. Yeah. I mean, you know, they're a critical element to the economy. I mean, we had to make the adjustment from the industrial era to a much more diversified economy. And yeah. the Pennsylvania, now you're the expert, Pennsylvania economy to me seems uh, uh, pretty pretty diverse. Uh, pretty diverse, and as one sector I didn't mention, agriculture. Yeah, you know, Agriculture oh. is, is critical for the state economy. It's, uh, and, and that's probably gonna grow, I, I, in my opinion, you know, being from the Netherlands originally and being honorary consul, I can see there's interest in more local production, uh, also because of logistical issues and cost of transportation. People like to have fresh food and fruit and vegetables mm -hmm. regionally, locally mm -hmm. produced. Uh, it saves money, it saves on CO2 emissions, so it helps with climate change. It has a lot of benefits. So uh, I'm actually working on a project right now between the Netherlands and Pennsylvania uh, in partnership with, with Harrisburg University and, and the Giant Group, for example, and others and the state, by the way, uh, on trying to, to develop a controlled environment agriculture in Pennsylvania, which is a huge sector in the, in, sorry, mm -hmm. in the Netherlands, sure. uh, has, has become a major factor for the Netherlands to become a big exporter. We have, we have less than a minute. Yeah. Let's go back to bipartisanship and how mm -hmm. important that is. Right. Well, I've, I've, I've worked under five governors in my career but after I moved to the United States as, as an immigrant. Uh, and I've seen you know, the importance of, of, of continuity in programs, you know, whether it's international business development or technology development, marketing, mm -hmm. tourism. We want people to have a long-term view and not go from one, from one thing to the other between administrations. All right, I want to thank you for coming yeah. on the program. All right, You're we'll welcome. see you next week for another edition of Pennsylvania Newsmakers. And as always, stay well.